toutes et à tous pour cette soirée conférence qui est donc soutenue par différents collectifs, le CADTM. The Stop Acquisition, the Third World Network, the team, and the Swiss Monde Network. And where I'm working, um, I'm Aude Martineau, and I'm at the Health Center. Swiss Monde is a small association that defends access for all to health care through different projects in Latin America and Palestine, Palestine and uh, through organizations that fight for their rights. And we've also worked a lot on the issues of intellectual property and hindrances to access to uh, medication. And this is the issue that yeah, we are looking at now, access to health on a global level and access to anti-COVID medication. Well, we, we, there have been some attempts to, uh, such as COVAX, to share vaccines, but we can say that they were a failure and then there's the second scandal that we can well, that we'll speak about the uh working on the back of the forest uh, with public funds financing almost all of the research for anti uh, for anti covid vaccines and these are private firms that take profit from it by using uh, tax evasion with countries like switzerland allowing this to happen and then the main tool Uh, allows these companies to have a mon monopoly and to impose their prices uh, through patents. And we're going to speak about that this evening. So this conference is part of the collective associations initiatives. It's organizations coming together to react, given these inequalities, given the patents. And um, if we see these in their fullness, we can say that this doesn't just take back from yesterday. It's been around for a long time. So we've chosen this time to hold this conference, linking up with other events at the moment on the 13th and 14th of October, the um, International uh, the Council of Intellectual Property Rights in the WTO spoke about te temporarily uh, removing patents, but that was not successful. And then the G20 in November will meet in Rome and will no doubt deal with this issue with no doubt the same result. So this evening, we wanted to have a moment of reflection, of exchange among ourselves to denounce this system, which continues to provide profit for the rich long before the health of um, and ignoring the health of the people. We have three speakers, Elian Nandine, a biologist and activist. And then we have, and she's also a member of the collective Common Goods and Then we will have Hong Kwe, who is a doctor and an activist as well. And then finally, Eric Toussaint, histori historian and politologist, who is a spokesperson for the abolition of illegitimate debt. So to give you a, few, a bit of information before giving the floor to the speakers, so we will divide it up in two parts. We'll have an intervention, then questions. So these will be done by right and there won't be uh, people asking, well, well, we, we would ask you to summarize your questions at the bottom of the screen. You have a Q&R where you can write a Q&A and you can um, write that in the language that you like and then we will read them out so that everybody can hear and we can then receive questions, uh, answers from the speakers. And that's one thing and then just to be sure that Everybody heard us, we have interpretation provided and thank you very much to the interpreters to, for providing interpretation this evening. So the interpretation into French, Spanish and English and to use it, you need to have downloaded the Zoom app onto your device and, and so you can't watch it uh, directly online. If you want the interpretation, you have to actually open Zoom And uh, there's a there's an icon at the bottom of the screen of a globe, and that's the interpretation menu. And you can choose the language you want to listen to there. So if that's good, then we can have the first um, presentation lasting 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, greetings. Thank you very much for inviting me to this online event today. So I am here on behalf of the collective on um, 
stop requisition, which is and um, which, and we work on um, patents. So I'll just share a few words to the start, and I think Frank will tell us a lot more. So this request is um, a general request for suspending um, patents for anti-COVID vaccines for, uh, led by South Africa and supported by India and now supported by many countries, including Joe Biden's US administration, except the EU, which is against this request. So this request asks for a suspension of the uh, patents on treatment and vaccines of COVID and trans technology transfer and all this in order to ensure that treatment can be provided and to meet the needs of the global population. So I'll just make a comment on the patent and vaccines. I think that we have to remember that um, in terms of uh, the vaccines, there are several patents for those that are on the market. There are several um, dozen uh, patents. I think we can speak about them in a bit. And so this request was launched following a uh, have a, a call from Frank and uh, the, the collective common goods is part of the collectives who responded to this call and they are among the initiators or the first signers of this petition and it seems that the main battle is questioning the intellectual property rights which are applied to patents on medication. So it was logical that this collective, um, well, it was obvious that we would get involved. Now, I, uh, my specialty is that medication, medicine, patents, and the impact that is had as a, as a result on the whole medication chain. Uh, and these effects have been underscored with the, have, have been exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic and the difficulties in terms of access to um, medication around the world. The reason why we started working on this is to contest the privatization and the commodification of health care services, including uh, medicines and vaccines. We can find all of that on our website. We have written a manifesto which summarizes our objectives in this manifesto. You can uh, gain access to it and you can still sign it actually. Now, we consider that the privatization and commodification, which is as a result of it, is mainly centered around the uh, patent rights. And this comes from intellectual property rights that are part of the capitalist system. Patents or intellectual property. So it's it's a type, patents are a type of intellectual property and they provide the issuer with the ownership the owner can exchange and sell or even speculate on its patent, on their patent, and they can even exclude all those who do not uh, possess it. And um, a patent prevents people having access to a natural resource, for example, uh, being able to cut down wood in a forest if it's been privatized, that can be protected by a patent. So knowledge, expertise, scientific knowledge, this is a global good and it excludes humanity by imposing patent rights. And so by issuing a patent, by having intellectual property rights over something that can prevent research, technology, innovation, and private companies to, uh, own these rights. And then they have exclusive access to profit from the results of the innovation and the research. And in general, for this last, uh, for a period of 20 years, uh, from this ownership, there's a monopoly from uh, large companies in the area of medication. So the medicine is a tool uh, for accumulating capital. And it means that nowadays only roughly 20 of 12, 20 large multinationals share um, most of the, uh, they draw most of the profit and they have such financial pressure that so a big pharma can impose on the state, on government, their industrial strategies, their commercial strategies, their trade strategies. They can impose uh, unfair prices also. So patents are essential 
which allow pharmaceutical industry to have control over all elements of the medication chain. So from so they take the they own the profits. They can they almost have control over prescriptions in hospitals, and they even have control over the training of healthcare professionals. So they use patents to com to maintain this control to keep their control. And big pharma are ferocious, are fiercely against any. Uh, the removal of any intellectual property rights. So, just for history, so. At that time, there was an imposition at international level. There was, uh, they imposed the respect for intellectual property rights, le legitimizing this. This was achieved through the uh, world trade organization uh, through the trips and these are uh, agreements on intellectual property rights that affect um, trade so these agreements were uh, negotiated in Marrakesh in um, 1994 with these agreements these health services and uh, so WH, uh, the, pay, the medication is no longer regulated by who but uh, the World Health Organization, but rather the WTO and countries that are not able to develop a, a medication. So, for example, countries in the global south, they have been banned from importing certain types of medication from a third country. They have to import it directly and they are also prevented from uh, importing uh, patented goods. And uh, India, on the other hand, is able to produce huge amounts of medicines, but, there's, but they're not able to produce generic and medication. So this is said to be um, counterfeit, and there can be sanctions and fines to be paid for those who do not respect the patent, but it was legal before 1994. Before 1994, all member states of the WTO, regardless of their development state situation, they had the same intellectual property rights for medication, and this globalization is the ownership of patents that has caused the uh, AIDS pandemic. Uh, India and other countries protested thanks to these protests and also thanks to mobilizations that have taken place across the country. Greater flexibility was introduced to these agreements. And uh, the, an obligatory, a compulsory license was was signed in Doha, and of, uh, compulsory licenses mean that a country can have the possibility of producing um, copies or generic medication. In the case of national emergencies such as AIDS, uh, malaria, tuberculosis, or other. Uh, and our other illnesses and COVID-19 could definitely be one of these. If, and this new flexibility represents a step back from the uh, from by the multinationals and a victory for activists. But this is still not a great achievement because um, it's so complex to apply the right measures. There are many delays, and so it is. Uh, so these measures, the flexibility has only been used about 20 times since the 2000s because it's so difficult to use them. And this flexibility, well, the, the, the EU hides behind this flexibility and says that um, obligatory licenses uh, explain the reason why they refuse to remove patents uh, as requested by South Africa, India, and many other countries. Um, compulsory licenses is so ineffective it can be done country by country and pharmaceutical industry requests compensation in exchange for licenses and this can cause problems for low-income countries that cannot um, deal with the demand so uh, this use of uh, compulsory licenses does not vaccines and um, and that would nevertheless allow vaccines to be shared around the world. So the European Union does not want to go further with these measures. And um, 
and they are asking for suspension of patents for treatments, uh, anti-COVID treatments, and we hope that this gives an opportunity to uh, put an end to the suspension in, in all healthcare. We note with great difficulty that the, the, the world population has access to vaccines and the economic model fo focused on um, patents exacerbates inequalities, huge inequalities. More than half of the global population does not have access to vaccines at the moment. And I think Frank will speak about that soon. And, uh, and it's not just about um, uh, COVID-19, the same was the true with uh, H1N1, the flu virus, and it's the same for many. Um, two billion humans do not have access to basic health care because it's too costly. Um, and uh, for a, a way of it indebting people is through health care. There are 30% of people in the US who do not have health care. And uh, despite the system in France, 10% 10, 10 of people do not access the services that are available because they don't have the money available. And, and uh, vaccines cannot be the absolute property. The intellectual property regime needs to be called into question. We have to understand that there's always a common part of property for vaccines and treatments in general. The common part are the millions of dollars of uh, public funding that have been that has been invested in research and investigate uh, research and innovation um governments contributed to vaccines that are developed in a common way and with um, public funding and this gives society this should give society the right to the treatment or the vaccines that are produced so this common part of the research has to be uh, acknowledged and there is an alternative that we can propose, and that is the that is the idea of common goods. Vaccines against COVID should be considered global common goods. Medication and vaccines are important because they guarantee the effectiveness of the right to health. They can also help us. So it means that private interests are not involved, that they should be outside of um, the market of, uh, of profit, possessing this is essential. We have to guarantee the use of all. And this means that we have to put in common all knowledge. We have to share all progress, all steps forward at global level. And we have to make all of the processes of manufacture public. This is impossible now with the intellectual property rights that are currently being applied. Health cannot be a source of profit for a handful of shareholders this is an issue of social justice thank you very much Merci beaucoup. Alors, je propose à... thank you very much i suggest that frank continues and i'd like to remind you that you can write questions in the q a uh, option below frank the floor is yours thank you so the WTO doesn't like us to talk about it. Big pharma lobbyist capitalists don't like us talking about it. And I, that's why I like to start with this. 20 years ago, in 2001, 39 of the biggest pharmaceutical companies in the world confessed that they preferred uh, making profit over um, the well-being of people. There was a trial in South Africa that in 1987 said, um, uh, dealing with HIV drugs, which was of course ravaging the world, but particularly affecting South Africa and Central Africa. 
faced with this confession, There were a lot of activists in the South, particularly from the access treatment campaign, who showed that in 1987 and 2001, when the trial took place, because the production of the product was blocked, 400 South Africans died simply because they were not treated, because 39 of the biggest pharmaceutical companies in the world wanted to make profit. The mobilization in South Africa and the world in general meant that the trial was uh, abandoned by Big Pharma and we won. And it's that chip that we need to use again, that bargaining chip that we need to use again today when it comes to COVID, because we are going to be able to bring about international mobilization to lift patents, to leverage technological transfers which are going to be essential to create free, voluntary, public and immediate vaccinations, which alone will be able to respond to the um, health crisis. So thank you to all my colleagues and also the interpreters who I cannot see at the moment. I'd like to thank you for uh, letting me take the floor here as I did in Geneva on the 13th of October with my Swiss comrades to say to the WTO that we need this mobilization. Now today, the situation is a little different. We're not talking about HIV anymore, but COVID. The WHO has told us that almost 5 million people died. The WHO has actually said it's probably three times higher than that figure. We haven't even talked about long COVID. We haven't talked about uh, women losing more of their income than men. They are victims of domestic violence people who don't have the right to social security or who don't really have work or the means to take care of themselves, to have access to oxygen or to be able to isolate themselves so as not to spread the virus. Um, these economies have been paralyzed. And so in a nutshell, COVID is unmanageable and it's even more unmanageable um, if you are a vulnerable person. And this is why we have seen that vaccines have been produced and they are incredibly effective. When we look at hospitalization and death rates, we can see that these vaccinations are reducing hospitalizations and deaths by about 80 to 95%. But they have also shown that they have the capacity to reduce the contamination rate of COVID. So basically, if I am vaccinated, I will most likely not be host hospitalized, but I also will probably not spread uh, the virus. So in France, Samuel Abizan, an epidemiologist, has shown that since vaccination campaigns have started, about 50,000 lives, lives have been saved. So by vaccinating ourselves, we are protecting ourselves, but we are also according to this uh, Pasteur Institute or the Colorado uh, study, we are reducing by 10 or 12 times the transmission of COVID. So if we look at the Delta variant, this transmission is even more significant. So we can see how effective these vaccination rates. You only need a factor of four or five, um, but we can see that we have the medical means, they were produced thanks to solidarity and human intelligence, and they have allowed us to reduce this mortal scourge of COVID that has been affecting us. But what is so scandalous is that this is a common good. Vaccines are a common good. They come from a genetic code. This genetic code is public. They have come from public funding that have been given by the Americans, $15 billion to pharmaceutical companies, by the EU, 1.5 billion euros, by the British government, 1.3 billion pounds to AstraZeneca, for example. And these elements, which were funded by public research and public funds, are then privatized by 
farmer to not uh, create better health for everyone else, but to above all defend and protect their profits. So the scandal here is that these patents that Eliane was speaking about have consequences. So first, everything is very opaque. I'd like to remind you that the contracts are not made public. A researcher called Vincent Kézébrin had to really show and do a lot of work to show how Moderna was able to fund um, its pre-purchases in tax havens. He released some documents and was able to show that Moderna was making a profit in 55% profit margin. So we can see how opaque this situation is. And so we want all trade uh, secrets to be revealed. We think that the elements of these trade secrets are what is causing all this skepticism about the vaccines and the fake news about the vaccines. And so by lifting, wavering these patents, that would be breaking this link between the pharmaceuticals industry and these elements of fake news and vaccine skepticism and hesitancy. So we need to convince the general population that vaccines are good. So the patent is the trade secret, but the patent is also extremely high prices, which are affecting our taxes, because of course, that's basically how they were funded. But the most important aspect here is that this scarcity around the patents means that people in the global south do not have access to the vaccine. This is because, or rather, 2% of inhabitants in the poorest countries are vaccinated, whereas in rich countries, the vaccination rate is about 63%. Now, of course, there are patents and mechanisms for solidarity. COVAX has been an absolute shipwreck. It's been a car crash. It has, it wanted to uh, vaccinate 10% of poor countries and they will not have achieved this by the end of 2021, which was their objective. COVAX is only hoping that a quarter of the 10% will be vaccinated. So only 4% of of all the doses administered in the world are done through this solidarity mechanism. So that's great for the 4% of the people who were vaccinated, but it is only serving to slow us down when it comes to lifting these patents and encouraging technological transfers as quickly as possible. So today we have a government in South Africa and India plus 200 organizations and states who on the 2nd of October demanded for a wavering of the patents on vaccines and anti-COVID treatments. It was refused, Joe, Burden, Joe, Joe Biden rather, and we are hoping that you know, Macron has made some statements in this regard, but he said he wanted to lift these patents, but nothing was done. He said he wanted to lift the patents. And then later on, when we saw the collapse of COVAX, um, the scandal is only continuing. So we saw 400,000 additional deaths in for, the, for HIV. And for us, we've done the same. Since the 2nd of October, for every day that passes, 10 million people died on average because these patents have not been wavered. This is a moral scandal. It is a health scandal. And it's a very short term bet for the rich countries to be making. Them, they're saying, yes, you're right, it's a scandal. Um, we have vaccines, they don't. Too bad for them, good for us. If these patterns aren't lifted, if these technologies aren't transferred, they're will be very high circulation of the virus. And this will increase um, 
the likelihood of variants to be made. So this will mean more and more people will need to be hospitalized and there'll be more variants. And so the Delta variant of the failure of having a rapid universal vaccination scheme, COVID continues to circulate because the patents haven't been lifted and because the technologies haven't been mutualized. So the virus escaped the vaccine and is becoming more and more widespread. So these rich companies think that they can protect themselves, but there is going to be a boomerang effect of more contagious um, variants coming around, which will render the vaccines less um, effective. That hasn't happened yet, but it is a very short term foolish bet that the rich countries have made. So. 10,119 daily deaths, 2% of people vaccinated in the global south, and now a third figure, 50 billion for in terms of revenue for big pharma from the vaccine. If we look at 2021 and 2022, it's 130 billion in terms of profit that has been forecast, which it's a pretty macabre comparison when we look at the 10,000 people who die every day because the patents haven't been lifted. They become billionaires in terms of dollars. This is an absolute scandal. We must mobilize. And this is the last piece of information that I'll give you before I move on to the part about mobilization. But if the patents are lifted, our capacities for production and manufacturing are there. For example, the WHO has set up a technological mutualization platform. But Big Pharma is saying, no, it's not possible. But that is not true. This WHO platform that Moderna and Pfizer are refusing to participate in have 19 candidates from 12 countries who have said that they will produce the mRNA vaccine. Then Moderna which makes about $18 billion, made $18 billion profit this year, showed that it was completely capable of making mRNA vaccines when it didn't have the industrial fabrication capacities. So Moderna is a company that was able to produce hundreds of thousands of vaccine doses. That's about 40,000 people. It got good results during its trials. It received millions of dollars of funding from the US to uh, fund companies to produce the vaccine. But instead of doing that, it uh, made an agreement with Lanza, a Swiss company. This Swiss company had never made an mRNA vaccine and they managed to do so in Vierne in Switzerland and then Porvos in uh, New Hampshire, Portsmouth in New Hampshire. In just two months, this factory was able to produce huge amounts of vaccines. When they said it was impossible, they were clearly lying. But the only way to make it possible is to lift the patents and mutualize and transfer the technologies. So how? I'm hoping that at a European level, they decided on the 13th of October in Geneva, the 30th of October, when the G20 will take place in Rome, and on the 30th of November to the 1st of December, the WTO is going to meet in Geneva. So we want there to be a launch of an appeal for um, this lift of patents. There will be a mobilization in Geneva to see what form it will take. But just today alone, Public Service International, which groups 700 trade unions across 150 countries, has contacted the campaign in Geneva to participate in the mobilization in front of the WTO, which could take the form of maybe a protest, maybe it'll be a meeting, we, we can decide the form it will take, but that's good news. 
our world is not for sale has also asked us to join the mobilization in Geneva, as well as MSF Geneva. I would like to remind you that the International Federation for Transport on the 13th of October sent an open letter demanding for the lift of patents, saying that the transport employees, particularly of mar maritime transport, are extremely vulnerable to COVID. Mortality rates on boats are three times higher than the average. So the idea is that the mobilization will reach a crescendo, it will reach an apex. It will say it's essential to transfer technology to serve nine people to become billionaires and for pharma companies. They can take lots of different forms. There was the European Citizens Initiative petition. There have been other mobilizations in different cities and capitals. Unfortunately, the spokesperson from the South couldn't be here this evening, but I think it's important that activists from the third world speak with us, contact us. They coordinate with us at an international level so that on the 30th of October, but above all on the 30th of November, we can make this demand. Lift patents that avoid deaths. Our lives are worth more than their profits. None of us has the right to health in this world. The pandemic doesn't care about borders, but we must lift patents, mutualize technologies. That is the appeal that we will be making. I will probably be with you in Geneva, we'll be far more numerous, but we will mobilize across Europe and across. Merci beaucoup. Alors, Eric, pour la dernière présentation. Thank you very much. And now over to Eric for the last presentation. If you can turn on your mic, please, Eric. D'abord, je voudrais remercier Eliane pour son explication. I'd like to thank Eliane for her explanation on patents there. I fully agree. I think that it's uh, incredibly interesting. It's uh, very powerful in terms of the arguments. And thanks to Frank for his enthusiasm regarding the mobilizations and his commitment. And uh, this is in a context which we have to acknowledge is a horrible one, a horrible context from the perspective of the number of victims in this pandemic, but also one of the things that really uh, hurts us deeply is the total silence, the total silence of the media, of governments, of the WTO, etc. We have been manipulated by the media for a one year and four months in the global north all the time, every day, at any hour, uh, every news um, bulletin we are lied to. I won't go into the detail, but we have been manipulated and lied to. And now it's almost the opposite. There's no talk of the pandemic. The, uh, they don't talk about global uh, infection rates anymore. And uh, I have been in Geneva and uh, who talks about the global levels of infection at the moment. Now, let me just give you an example. François Hollande and roughly 40 other heads of state wrote a letter and they were asking in this letter for opinions to be changed and we have, and I have heard nothing about that in the international press, but this was a letter signed by 200 people 
people who I don't like at all. But the silence now, the silence that we have in the face of this traumatic scandal, to patents, to remove patents, and the absolute failure of COVAX, well, we see complete silence around this, and it is a deafening silence, and this is, and but we have taken, this is, these are things that we've committed to. The, uh, the largest share of the population has been, uh, that has been lied to it. It's, it kind of seems as if there's a liberation from COVID in the global north because it's not being talked about anymore. But there are lies, there are omissions on what is really happening. When you have the declarations of the director of the WHO denouncing the situation, and over the last few days, we're told once again that the doses provided through COVAX are absolutely not enough, much lower than what had been promised, that there is no word on that. On the other hand, if we simply look at just a small part of what you were saying, you were saying that it's um, time to turn things around. Um, well, if Barton in the uh, WTO negotiations had said to Germany, to Japan, to Norway, to Switzerland, that they should, if, the, if he had said, listen, this is so serious, this is such a serious situation that we have to take a decision, and if they had said that as uh, le international leaders, world leaders, that could have really changed the situation and we know that uh, several countries well you need unanim unanimity it costs nothing to say that uh, well if we say to well, they could say this to the rest of the world and then they can hide behind the refusal of norway switzerland germany and the situation of Europe, it's uh, very easy for him. I'm sure that he has links with Pfizer and Moderna. These are US companies or European companies. And you can say, you're not doing enough here. There are no consequences. You're going to keep your patents. And it's terrible because we're, we're always, there are always announcements. So when it's announced that COVAX, uh, well, uh, we have 200,000 vaccines before the end of the year, that is that is said. And then when or the ambassador, the WTO, when they say we are in favor of removing patents, that's said. And then it's not spoken about at all anymore. It's just said once. And now, I'm really shocked. I try to listen regularly to the so-called debates it's on France Inter, the French radio. So uh, the debate between Thomas Piketty and an, a financial journalist. And but I think it's absolutely horrible. The the echo is the worst. The uh, the echo in terms of this editorial line is actually the worst. And Thomas Piketty spoke about this scandal at the WTO, and he was, and I listened to everything that there were, they, they, there was not a word on the real issues. So they are, there are people who are just trying to uh, neglect the issues or just to ignore them or to turn their eyes away. We haven't been invited for a long to France Inter for a long time, me and others who used to speak on these shows and the people are not 
and the calls are not being put out. So the situation, quite honestly, is very serious because we absolutely need to have these mobilizations, but we also need to think about the huge difficulties that we have and uh, it's about ensuring that this leads to important mobilization. So, Frank, if I say that, well, I'm saying that not to demobilize us or to discourage us, but really to understand the difficulties that we're facing. The great success in South Africa and obliging the government to take action against the multinationals. You know that um, the government was denying even the existence of the uh, AIDS virus at first. And it was thanks to a campaign that mobilized many people in South Africa. And it's only thanks to that that finally the government went back to the demand and uh, confronted the multinationals because of the um, social movements and their mass protests. So if we cannot ensure that large health companies actually include these things in their programs or and uh, movements, if we don't manage to prov provoke big movements, we're going to have huge problems. Now it's the trade unions don't include this in their demands either. We've just had a few declarations when there were the negotiations at the WTO, when some of you were in Geneva, Frank was there, and the trade unions had a long list of uh, organizations to come together saying we need to remove the patents. And then on the day of joint action on the 20, 26th of September, people came together, the young people were saying the patents have to be removed. And then I think it's 2 million signatures um, and that's removing the, uh, it was George Clooney and other people like that who signed. But there is now deafening silence on this. And so the big, large media is, does not mobilize on this. They don't ask, they don't put out calls, they don't ask, um, they don't appeal to people's consciences. They don't try to mobilize the people. And we have to consider this challenge and we have to think, how is it that we can uh, use all of the social media to raise awareness and have the capacity to mobilize people. We need to have that capacity to mobilize people. That has to be part of what we do. And then in terms of the analysis now, well, so as not to repeat what we have heard, which was very correct, we, and rather to complement what was being said, to add to what was said, this crisis of the pandemic is part of the the multinational global capitalist crisis. The pandemic, or rather the type of virus that we are facing, got Ebola and a whole other series of viruses that have come one after another. Side, we come together and we say that this is linked to the the crisis in ecology, the ecological crisis around the world. Animals live and these animals are then sold. You know, all of that leads to um, more zoonosis. It means that there are more uh, animals in close and 
the viruses can therefore spread much more easily. The health crisis is therefore linked to the environmental crisis. And all of this is because of a generalized commodification of anything that can be sold. So uh, the patents are, are part of that. They can be bought and sold. And by this commodification in this multidimensional crisis for countries in the global south and also for countries in the global north, there's the issue of debt. Fortement augmenté à partir des années où from the 1980s has been 40 years and that the World Bank and the IMF have been able to impose uh, structural adjustment policies which are basically in all imaginable areas. They allow governments from the global south to turn their back on uh, common goods, public goods, and privatizing to the maximum, privatizing health. It, it degrades the quality of health services. And this means that in the case of a pandemic, um, states and health services find themselves in a more, more difficult situation and they're not able to respond to the needs of the population. The case of Brazil, of course, is a key example. Brazil has now gone over six, has gone beyond 600,000 deaths because of AIDS, and it's a country which um, measures in South Africa as well. Some countries in Africa, the poorest countries, or some of them are marginal compared to the large, uh, outside of the large flows of tourism. And so that means that they, well, they, they are part of, they do have large tourism flows, so, so they've been safe. But in the DRC, um, very few people have been vaccinated, but they actually have very low on many tourism. So I think it's really the map of globalization when you look at it. So it's interesting to observe this. And I say this with a smile, but actually it's a very dramatic situation. You can see the speed at which the virus circulates. There's China and Italy. it passed to China, Italy, Canada. And this is because tourists were going from one country to another. And so they were spreading the virus, and this so is the same as that map is the, same, the infection map is the same as the globalization map. When you look at it, so tourism has meant that they shut down internet. Uh, well, if you look at the international flights that they had to shut down. So now uh, I'm coming back to the issue of debt and structural adjustment. So in terms of instrumentalizing debts done by, and this was done by the IMF and the World Bank, we've got the, got the agreements on the uh, intellectual property rights for trade, the, uh, medication, treatment, healthcare, was included in those intellectual property rights and the IMF and the World Bank used that were reluctant to accept the signing of the WTO agreements in the area of intellectual property rights, particularly in vaccines. And they said, you have to sign this. If you don't sign this, you will not have other payments, you will not receive help from us in terms of debt. So we have to understand the links here, the links between 
a global capitalist crisis, an ecological, an environmental crisis, a health crisis, an economic crisis, of course. And we have to think about the issue of debt, the issue of international institutions, and the way in which they use blackmail, particularly debt and they, how they use the argument to say, if you want to be an in international trade, you have to sign this investment rights in, on uh, commercial agreements on the issue of patents. So all of these things are linked together. So now to wrap up, to add to what Elian and what Frank said, well, they have quite rightly uh, criticized these huge profits. And so we have to think who, well, who's been benefiting from the crisis in the last two years, but apart from Big Pharma. Well, Google, Amazon, Facebook, and others have, uh, including Zoom, a Zoom, which was a startup at first, and we have to use their services right now, even to have our meetings with interpretation, because uh, the alternatives to Zoom up until now do not allow several different channels for interpretation. That's why we are forced to use Zoom here today. And if you have alternatives to propose, then pre please let us know. And so we use Google, Gmail, WhatsApp, Zoom to communicate. And we do that because uh, certain co these companies have a monopoly over communication and they protect their rights as well. And Okay, so what I wanted to say is that it's not just that there's an incredibly high level of profit, so one fifty percent profit even for a capitalist, you know that there are, well, five or ten percent for many is actually and then if you're talking about 20%, 50% profitability, that is absolutely incredible. That's the return that they get from the, on their investments. And one thing worth adding is that patents, well, that a patent lasts 20, 20 years. Uh, you need a third dose for the countries in the global north and that they talk about the cost of providing for the global south. Uh, we could uh, limit the injections of the boosting jabs of, uh, to only people who really need them, and we could liberate a whole load of doses for the global south. But we're also told that the, that we need, um, we'll need to come back and get boosters every year. So for Pfizer, for Moderna, for others, just imagine what that represents. It's 20 years of uh, profit, a uh, hyper profit. And then if we look at well, free competition of patent, patent means that, patents mean that, um, the big pharma person who issued, who obtained the uh, who obtained the patent. Well, as you said, there are many patents on these vaccines, and that's because they cut into little pieces the, the rights. And Moderna has issued. 550 uh, patents or obtained some those 500 patents. And so I suppose that Moderna has used 
the uh, manufacturing process so as to ensure that any company that uses even a tiny part of the uh, of the vaccine has to pay Moderna. And it said in an article that uh, it, 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 they were saying we shouldn't pay because the um, because the uh, because there, it was public taxpayer money that went into it in the first place, and and it's the it's a, there's a national body that provides the patent. Moderna does not pay uh, fees or doesn't pay back money to the to the state to the American government. But they do possess rights over any use, even the tiniest use of a part of their patent. And so, if we look at free, comp fair competition, well, we've got other pharmaceutical companies from um, taking part in competition, and so it's income with a captive audience, we could call it, because we tell people, we force them, we say, you need to have a green pass, you all have to be vaccinated. And behind that, there's the private company that has a monopoly over the production of the vaccine and the power of the state, well, the, the US state refuses to use the uh, and it refuses to remove the patent. So the patent is necessary. All you need to do is to use the patent that belongs to you. And as we were hearing from public citizen recently, $8 billion, even though they have already spent $14 billion, and they give pharmaceutical companies the, all of this, and they could just have spent eight billion and produced um, nine doses of vaccine with that money. And they could even give away the patent or patent rights to anyone who says that they will produce the vaccine, but they're not doing that either. And so this shows that Biden is not in any way adopting the policy that he should adopt. And so uh, um, important media like Public Citizen are announcing Biden saying, you have a product that has been financed by taxpayer money and you should produce it. You should produce vaccines. So we have to denounce uh, those. We have to denounce this situation. And so I'll finish by saying that I know that we don't, that we might not um, make this heard, but we have to speak about expropriation of the pharmaceutical industry. We have to absolutely say that we need to socialize the pharmaceutical industry. The pharmaceutical industry is has to be part of a public service, public health service. So it was a, an achievement after the uh, Second World War, the it was the National Health Service was a huge achievement during the Second World War. And then there was Margaret Thatcher who systematically attacked it and uh, and reduced it in size. And now it still exists, but there are, but since the Second World War, uh, there are, well, since the Second World War, we have to go back and say that health is something that is too serious to be handed over to big pharma capitalists. It's uh, like saying war is too serious to be entrusted to generals. And so um, the same is true for um, health is too important to be put in the hands of big pharma or private companies. It's citizens, it's the public who should be the ones responsible for care and uh, 
um, and we should prevent the private sector from developing uh, neoliberal medicine and the production of medication and treatment all of that it should be the both well, as you know at the moment the private sector finances research but the outcomes of those research, of that research well it's there for big pharma and it's then shared through uh, patents and uh, private companies have to pay for that very same um, thing. So uh, the two, 2nd of October, South Africa asked for the patents to be removed and and that was uh, 20, 20th of October, 2020. And now it's the 25th of October, 2021. So that's a year and three months. A year and three months, governments have been asking for patents to be removed. And there has been a dozen sessions in uh, the WTO. And each time it is hindered, it's blocked. And the initiative of India and South Africa, well, there were roughly 60 countries supporting it. And now it's over a hundred countries behind it, 105, but given that you need unanimity, it won't pass. And so that shows the, the serious battle that we have to fight because in, well, remember that the a multilateral agreement on investments and localization, well, uh, the OECD, um, was forced to abandon that in the end. And for over a year, well, we've had over a million deaths and they, they're still not giving in at all. They're not giving in. They're not giving in in terms of patents. So the challenge for us is, is uh, incredibly stressful. It's agonizing. How, what can we do to ensure that we really can provoke mobilizations, real fractures in society um, and to shake people up, shake up the powers that be so that they really do take measures uh, as a result of public pressure. And in this way, they can respond to the needs of the people. And just one last comment. Uh, and these companies that have received these billions, are they going to offer reimbursements? It's a very relevant question. Well, no, they're not. All of this is strictly money down the drain. There is no agreement which says that uh, we lend you the money and you pay it back. And in my article, on Big Pharma, uh, Big Pharma against common goods. Well, you can clearly see that there is a link. So the agreement uh, between the European Commission and Moderna, which allows Moderna to uh, that they receive from the or obliges them to declare the payments if they receive 10 billion from the European Commission then they have then they go and declare that as tax in Switzerland and they have another um, company in Switzerland and the European Commission accepts this they have signed a contract uh, they signed it in December 2020 with Moderna saying we will pay the price of the medication so 20 euros per dose, so or 1950, 19 euros 50 per dose. And before you receive your first dose, we give you uh, 50 dollars for the, for the doses that we have. So it's not a, a it's not a loan. And then in this contract, 
which uh, you can see if you click on the article in my, um, if you click on the link in my article, the European Commission says if the vaccine, which was in uh, a test phase still, if that causes death, well, Moderna will not be responsible for that. They cannot be held responsible. So all of the effects which could come as a result of the tests and the vaccination will Moderna is uh, has complete impunity. There's no exercise, there's no rights. Um, that just means that if there are complaints, it's the European Commission that will pay, that will um, reimburse the victims. And Fortunately, the effects of Moderna's vaccine, really in terms of collateral impacts, they're quite limited. And Frank explained this quite clearly. So we can trust these vaccines. But you can see the, what, uh, how far we've got. They're not going to reimburse, and then all of the all of the side effects. They for at least in the European Union, the Commission says we will take on the responsibility because we are the ones who have ordered these doses and. Uh, the, in, the side effects of injecting. So really, I think we have to lead a campaign and say, realize what is happening in, in the public, in society. We absolutely need to be able to hold people responsible and medicine should be provided at the cost of production. It should be free for people and to uh, shut people up to stop the concerns. They buy the vaccines at a very expensive price, and then they provide them for free to the citizens. So the citizens are not, don't even ask how much does this dose cost? Because receiving an injection without paying anything, well, what we could say then actually 460 million doses, that's uh, 10 billion euros. And the government will learn that because they don't have it. They don't tax big pharma. And so that means it's extra debt. And in France, after the election of the president, well, after the presidential elections next year, you'll see that there's, well, there are calls for austerity saying we did whatever it costs, whatever was needed to do, but now we have to pay back that we need to make more efforts with the budget and more efforts. Um, so that's it, and uh, a great pleasure once again to have shared this with you, with Frank and Helene. Oh, uh, thank you very much. I can see thank you. we've already got quite a few questions. So I'll take them in order. So the first came during Eliane's presentation. Um, but of course, the two other uh, panelists are more than welcome to answer the questions. So someone wants to know that if the patent or the vaccines, will a number of countries actually be able to produce them? Then there's a question from 
Christian on TRIPS waiver and TRIPS flexibilities. Is the TRIPS waiver global while TRIPS flexibilities are only national? Then for a third question, when you talk about inequalities to vaccine access, are you including the fact that in some countries there are not many locations to actually get vaccinated? I don't know, maybe Eliane, if you want to start us off. Yes, I can answer the question regarding the differences between the patent waiver and the flexibilities. Now, the patent waiver can be done um, generally, so we're not going to lift all of them. But let's say in Europe, we would do it for 38 different countries. So if we were going to waiver European patents on a technology or the vaccine or mRNA, for example, we would do it for all 38 countries at the same time. But if we were to apply the license itself, then one by one, each country would have to ask individually. And each time there would be binding measures um, and agreements made with each different country. So the negotiations would be incredibly long per country. And then each country would have to pay financial compensation to the company with the patent in question. So that's one of the main differences, I would say. So that's for that question. And then for the next question, Frank, do you want to answer the first question? Or do you want me to answer it? As you wish. Go ahead then. So the message from the pharma industry is about sowing doubt on the capacity to produce mRNA vaccines apart from big companies. I've already spoken about this. There are 19 candidates, particularly from southern countries, on this um, vaccine mutualization platform. We said they are able to produce their mRNA vaccine. Moderna, who produces hundreds of millions of doses, doesn't actually produce it itself. It used other companies, Swiss companies, Lonza, for example, who didn't even have the production capacity itself. Uh, but in just a few months, thanks to the mutualization of funds and technological transfers, was able to uh, manufacture millions and millions of doses. Eric and I have already spoken about this, is that there's this very interesting public citizen study that went to speak with researchers at Oxford University to ask them, how could we vaccinate the part of the global population that hasn't been vaccinated yet. So they used a software that the pharmaceuticals industry uses to plan um, the companies that would need to be used. So let's say you want to do however many billions of doses, then they will say, right, you need to buy such and such product in such and such and such a quantity, and it will take X amount of time. It'll take this X amount of in production sites, it'll take this many employees and it'll cost you this much. So if we use the same means as the pharmaceuticals industry that they use to make their productions, then we have this incredible figure, Eric already quoted it, for $9 billion, we can in about nine months provide 9 billion doses. That's 4.5 billion vaccinated people, so double vaccinated, because the other half of the world paid a lot of money to get vaccinated. We are 7 billion, so that we are lacking 4.5 billion vaccines at this point. So the technology is rapidly mobilizable, can be rapidly mobilized. So when Big Pharma tells us, oh, no, it's so complicated, by lifting patents and technological transfers, we can do it. 
public citizen has used the same analytical elements that Big Pharma uses to plan these companies. It's possible, it needs to be done, but first, the two preconditions are lifting all patents and technological transfers. So we need to lift all patents, whether it's Moderna's or Pfizer's or AstraZeneca's. It was all publicly funded. I hope I have responded to your question. Then um, Eric already spoke about this, but the WHO reformed its funding, and so it does funding per pathology. So pathologies in the global south aren't always the same. There are four older infectious diseases, but maybe in the developed uh, countries, there are problems such as diabetes and cancer. So public health is what uh, the global south is asking for. And that's what we are asking for as well. We're not saying that everything should be directed towards COVID because in Africa, there are 400 million deaths a year because of malaria. What we need is global health. And when we have global health, the people, the, the, the policymakers who will be able to make a vaccine against malaria, but then they will also be able to provide mosquito nets and support. So it's just this concept of global health. And currently the destruction of public health systems means that it is sometimes very complicated to vaccinate people. But the first uh, three or four obligatory vaccines when you are a child have been developed. So it should be possible to develop a vaccine against malaria and against COVID. That the WHO have also used part of their funding uh, to combat tuberculosis, HIV, but what we are really defending here is global health that protects um, uh, people from uh, diseases that largely affect people in the global south, but also COVID. That's all. Eric, did you want to add anything? Your mic. We can't hear you, Eric. Eric, we just need you to turn on your mic. Can you hear me now? No, there wasn't really a specific question for me. Eliane and Frank have responded, have answered them um, very well. I just wanted to bring up something here. We've spoken about detailed studies. But just to continue what I was saying earlier, and the enormous profits that Big Pharma makes. So normally, Pfizer will say it'll cost about 20 euros per dose. Their production costs are about one euro. So their profit margins, even when we talk about 50%, it's probably higher than 50%. But what is amazing, and I put a link to it in my article, there was a conference with the financial director of Pfizer and the other main uh, stakeholders and the board of Pfizer. It is, it's publicly available. They want to show to their shareholders that, you know, they are transparent and they don't care that we're going to go and read their documents. And the financial director of Pfizer, his name is Frank D'Amalio, and he said, listen, the price is a pandemic price. Once the pandemic has been declared as over by the WHO, so we will continue vaccinating people against COVID, but once it is no longer a COVID, then we will return to the market price. And the market price, he says, is between, I'll say it in euros, 
is between 100 euros the dose and 130 euros. Can you imagine what these people are talking about to their shareholders? And most of you probably haven't even heard about this because it's just not common information, but it is totally accessible. So Macron and his health minister are in Belgium, the Belgian government, the Swiss government, they are not talking about this to their citizens. On the contrary, they are saying, let's not ask any questions. Let's inject everyone and we will pay whatever it takes. And in some ways we are forcing you to be vaccinated. Now I think for Frank Elian or myself, we of course want people to be vaccinated. We want to convince people to get vaccinated. We don't want to force people to be vaccinated. There are vaccinations, there are also treatments, there is obviously a prevention. All of this is incredibly important to develop and fund. Yes, I think we mustn't forget that there are also treatments because in the global south, I think that might be easier to roll out than vaccination. Because particularly if the doses have to be kept, you know, at minus 20 degrees, um, treatments might actually be more feasible to be rolled out in smaller villages and small boxes. And then you treat people already who are already ill and then vaccinate those who are not yet ill. So we mustn't stop our research on treatment. We're talking a lot about vaccinations at the moment, but treatment can still be very important. Thank you. I'm going to take another two and final questions, and then we will move on to our conclusion. So there's a question about the um, sums transferred to pharmaceutical companies that are never reimbursed, but Jidu asked another question. How can you explain that there are no more variants while global vaccination rates are still quite low? Is there a scientific reason for this? And the second question is, what is the total uh, production of doses in each one of these companies? I don't know which one of you would like to begin. It was, it came up during Frank's presentation. Yeah, I can answer. Right, so for the variants, coronavirus is much more stable than um, flu variants. They evolve much more easily. And now in terms of vaccination, we have four types of flu variants. So every year, the WHO also write, you need a vaccine against this variant. So each virus is slightly different. There are a series of variants that are appearing. And mathematically speaking, the more widespread, the more variants. But we have noticed that the variants so that they can spread, must modify the same protein. So we have variations, but they aren't particularly significant variations. And this is why, in terms of mortality and hospitalization rates, the vaccine is still effective. But when it comes to spreading the disease, they're less effective because the virus is more contagious. But we are very lucky when it comes to the coronavirus um, to have a variability. So this capacity to mutate, it, it sort of mutates in the same way. This is all quite complicated. It's all about virology. But the main idea here is that it isn't a kind of virus that mutates a huge amount. And for the moment, our vaccines are still incredibly effective when it comes to hospitalization rates. I think I'll just leave it there.
I mean, there will still be hotbeds that will arise and new variants will always come up. And this is why we need vaccination at a global level. You just need a little hot spot somewhere, a hotbed somewhere, and then tourists to be traveling or even, I don't know, a, a businessman traveling, and then we'll see new variants. So I think we've been lucky so far that there haven't been more so far. Corona, but it, it's true what you say, coronavirus isn't as um, transmutable as other flu viruses. Eric, do you want to add anything? Yes. Just to say that I think for me, it is essential that we launch uh, this appeal that Frank mentioned earlier, and that we be as convincing as possible about mobilizing and to say that all the efforts carried out in this sense, I think we're going to have an online coordination meeting soon. Frank has already sent the link to a certain number of people. But we must favor mobilization at a European level. We need to check this at a global level. Would it be possible to convoke global action? And try and, at a maximum number of countries. I mean, we've seen the young people, they have mobilized for the same for, for the climate change movement. We saw recently there were about a million people. And back in 2003, 18 years ago, there was the great day of protest against the war in Iraq. There we had 12 million people mobilized. So we've still got a long way to go. But I do think we need to ask ourselves this question. You know, in the middle of the First World War, at the end of the First World War, you would never have thought about having to protest for a, you know, a day against the Spanish flu. But we know now that the pandemic the um, lack of preparation made by Big Pharma, the responsibility of governments who are funding Big Pharma, all of this must push us towards a day of global uh, mobilization. It's not easy. We have never been able to do it before, but it isn't because it's never been done before that something is difficult that we can't try. We need to try and convince organizations who have the clout at an international level to try and mobilize something. For example, picketing in front of big farm companies in each country, in front of their governments, in front of WTO representative bodies. These sorts of mobilizations, I think they could be significant. Those are my conclusions. I was really pleased to be able to participate in this panel. Yeah, and Eric, I just wanted to add that on the 13th of October in South Africa, in front of the main embassies of rich countries, uh, protesters asked for the waiver of patents. The same was done in India and Brazil, and there were protests. So we could have some kind of coordination, not necessarily at a European level, but um, maybe in a rich level. And it's such a shame that Chi Yuk Ling couldn't in, uh, join us today. But the message here needs to be so much stronger. So that is the objective on the 30th of November, and I will end on this, is that you must write that date down we want to have some kind of mobilization. We will do it in Geneva and in all capitals across the country that there will be initiatives to say that they are ashamed of their governments who are blocking the transfer of technologies and the waiver of patents.
Thank you to all three of you. Eliane, did you maybe just want to say a final word at the end? No, I would just like to say that I was really pleased to participate in this online conference. And I hope that we have managed to convince everyone that we must continue fighting and pay attention to the dates, as Frank mentioned, on the 30th of October, the 30th of November. Merci. Merci à you. Uh, you know, bring our cause forward. Thank you. Thank you to our interpreters. Thank you for organizing this meeting as well. I think the message is clear. We are motivated. All the organizations involved in this evening's conference are motivated. And we want to overcome this capitalistic predatory system. So thank you once again.